Is the religion of peace one of the greatest civilizational achievements of northern Germany? The reasonable response should be basically no, but that's not the image one would have gotten earlier this year if one had visited one of the largest regional museums in Germany, Das Altoner Museum. Let's explore. everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so as I'm brushing up the stories from Germany that I gathered earlier this year during the tour, I remembered the visit I paid to the Altoner Museum in Hamburg. It wasn't really part of the plan to visit this particular museum, but since I bought a permit for the Hamburg's Long Night of Museums, which happened to take place while I was there, I thought I might as well make use of it. Besides, this was also a good incentive to travel in almost every area of the free and Hanseatic city, which is so awesome that in itself is a federal state of Germany. And not just that, but also the state or Bundesland with the highest human development index in the Federal Republic. The free port in it has a lot to do with that, of course, but we'll keep the story of Hamburg overall for another day. So. Altoner Museum is the second or third largest regional museum in Germany, depending on whose classification you choose to believe. As the name suggests, the museum is primarily about the history of Altona, though its mission is to focus on the art and cultural history of northern Germany overall, as well as the historical development of the Elbe region around Altona, Schleswig-Holstein and the coastal areas next to the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. That sounded interesting, especially since I had known previously that this area was for over 200 years under Danish rule, the Danish rule ending only in 1864, which by history standards is basically the day before yesterday, if we're being honest. So I got into the museum hoping to find quite a lot about the history of the city under Danish rule, the history of the city as an independent city from 1864 till 1937, as well as the process of integrating the city into the larger Hanseatic neighbor through the Gross Hamburg Gesetz or the Greater Hamburg Act during the National Socialist rule in 37-38. Also, starting from the 17th century and up until early 1920s, the area had a significant Jewish community and one hoped that this would be reflected in the museum. I would have loved to get a glimpse on how the Jews and the Danes got along in a German city that was not in Germany. Surely that sounded interesting. And sure enough, we do get a bit of how people lived, uh, how the living quarters changed over time, a bit about the period when the city was hit by cholera, a lot about the economics of the city prior to being annexed by Hamburg, including some old footage, which is quite nice, but almost nothing on the political history of the city, neither the good nor the bad. It's as if the city had almost no political history. Well, except for this piece of bragging on how the city became increasingly totalitarian after 1914, except the architects of this museum think it's something to brag about because, you know, having increasingly complicated rules that ruin innovation and prevent development is the German way. 
It's actually quite funny, in the same bit where they brag about how great things were because Altona was one of the first cities in Germany to pursue what they call an active property policy, which is a nice German euphemism for the state micromanaging your own property, then they also acknowledge that the housing shortage the policy was supposed to address, in fact, did get a lot worse under the policy. Surface-wise, the museum is pretty big, so while I was looking for more about the economics and the culture and kept on stumbling upon more exhibits of, um, let's face it, low interest, I did finally find a section about culture. They say it was about the culture of Altona, so it must be true. Mahala Altona was the temporary exhibition meant to enchant the visitors for the period that included the long night of museums. The word Mahala is of Arabic origin and it still means an occupied space, referring to a geographical area. It doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation in Arabic, though it does have a negative connotation in the languages of the countries that survived the Ottoman occupation. Back in my neck of the woods, Mahala is the way you refer to a ghetto in a polite conversation where you're expected not to use haram words. <laughs> so here, in this section dedicated to the culture of Altona, we find a lot of useful and interesting artifacts like candy. If I had not caught this on camera, nobody would have ever believed me, but here it is, Haribo candy made in Turkey as an artifact in a museum about the culture and history of northern Germany. I'm sure this makes sense somehow from a German perspective. Further into this marvelous section dedicated to culture, there is, of course, a German authorized translation of the Quran, a very important book for the history and culture of northern Germany, so important that taxpayers' money had to be paid for this. And then we get a bit of introduction into the highly important concepts in the local culture, calmly explained to us in Arabic and German, concepts such as haram, halal, imam, or kajol. Kajol is the halal way of wearing makeup, highly popular in Iran, and apparently northern Germany, as exemplified in this museum. We also get an introduction to basic Quranic analysis, such as al alaq or the first revelation to Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Mecca, available in the 96th surah in the Quran. We also get introduced to the concept of the Hadith, the Sunnah, the Hijab, and of course, Ummah. 
The museum runs short of explaining the notion of Dar al-Islam to us, but maybe because that's not yet part of the culture of northern Germany. Unlike zakat, which is the religious tax on Muslims, and which is apparently common and old enough to be in the culture section of a regional museum. Now isn't this great? Surely this is the pinnacle of northern Germany's civilizational achievements, given that this section is one of the large ones and gets the highest amount of respect, offering detailed explanations like no other. For comparison, check out this room, which, while well maintained, has no guidance on what exactly we're looking at. It looks old, all right, but how old? What is the context? One could suspect that because it's not Quranic enough, it's not worth a very detailed response. I mean, look at the vendor being represented. She's not even wearing a hijab. Kinda terrible, nicht wahr? <laughs> now, in all seriousness, this really is terrible. This museum has more religion of peace in it than a museum in Sarajevo, a city with proportionally more Muslims than Altona ever had in its almost 500 years of existence. It's easy to take this example and use it to further the narrative of Islamization, especially given that the museum is located right next to the railway station Hamburg-Altona, an area that does have indeed a high level of non-European immigrants per capita. It also doesn't help that it was the campaign for the European elections when I visited the area, and almost all of the election-related displays in the area surrounding the museum were from either the Social Democrats or the Linke, or in other words, the left or the far left, all speaking about Altona for all, thus furthering the toxic and divisive propaganda that the only acceptable way to look at this area is through a cosmopolitan or open borders perspective. So I could be trying to play with your emotions and farm your outrage clicks on this video. But I won't, because the purpose of this channel is not to produce viral videos or to be popular. The purpose of what we're doing here is to be correct, regardless of how many people agree. Still, whilst the narrative of state-financed Islamization would be going a bit too far into the exaggeration territory, the question is still legitimate. Why? Why did the foundation of historical museums in Hamburg find so important to sponsor such an exhibit in a museum about an area that has, for all intents and purposes, zero history with the religion of special needs and, even today, with high levels of immigration, still a marginal interest anyway? I wrote two very polite emails to them since my visit, but since they declined to comment, I'll take the liberty to speculate. And my speculation is this, a combination of gullibility and pressure to pander. This weirdness is not the fault of Muslims in Altona, mind you. While I won't claim to have a sociological study, I did ask several dozens of people around the area what do they think about this issue, and most of them did not even know this exists, and those that did know simply didn't care or were opposed to it. One Arab man with uh, his wife and children even told me outright this could piss off the regular Germans even more and for no reason whatsoever since nobody's life is improved by having Islamic teaching in a German history museum.
Now, you could say that this was a temporary exhibition and that it's not that bad. Well, yes and no. Because the temporary exhibition lasted for a few months and then was replaced by one of modern art, a lot of it of Islamic inspiration too, according to the always vague Facebook pages and groups that are supposedly there to provide unbiased information about museums in Hamburg. Still, the museum lacks a lot of information that should be in a museum about this borough with a past as an independent city. A general in the Greek army who took part in the 1820s Greek Revolution was born in Altona. German philosopher Konstantin Brunner was not only born here, but lived a significant chunk of his adult life here as well. Ernst Tellmann, the leader of the Communist Party for much of the Weimar Republic and the founder of what we know, what we now know today as Antifa, was also born here and conducted some of his activity here. A lot of what is now world history was written by people born here, yet somehow none of that found its place in the permanent exhibition of the Altoner Museum. But a place for an introduction to the Quran did. One can scream far-right bigot until one's face turns blue, but this doesn't change the fact that Altoner Museum neither serves nor represents the community it is tasked to tell the story of. If I had been a random backpacking tourist who just purchased a permit for all the museums at the airport for the city break, I would have been left none the wiser upon visiting this museum, or even worse, I would have been left with the impression that Altona is basically an Islamic borough. And that is the problem, because while it didn't affect me, aside from the fact that it wasted my time, this museum did affect all the other tourists who were given a distorted picture. In what way is that beneficial to the free state of Hamburg or of Germany as a whole? Seriously, even from a left-wing, pro-immigrationist, cosmopolitan perspective, this is still a spectacular own goal which is probably why I'm even making this video to begin with. <laughs> Ultimately, something will have to change, both in Hamburg and at a federal level in the way the authorities, both political and cultural, approach this issue. Because while this is not as often as an occurrence as one might be tempted to think, it's still more often than it should be. Way too many decision makers just reflexively side with a pro-Islam narrative even if they don't believe it themselves, or because of an irrational fear of repercussions which it is rarely backed up by facts. In many ways, the situation both back in May when I taped these images and today resembles the situation uh, in 2014 or 2015 in Sweden. There is a corridor of opinion on certain topics, this being one of them, except the enforcement of it has gotten more relaxed in the last 12 months, but the willingness to break free of it remained pretty low. In Sweden, when the corridor of opinion fell, more and more people rushed to get closer to the truth, which was previously outside of the corridor. In Germany, the corridor of opinion seems to be more like a mental one. Far too many people in decision-making positions seem mentally imprisoned into a paradigm that, to an outside observer, has clearly reached its limits. Now, you may disagree, but there is no evidence whatsoever that something bad would have happened if the museum had simply refused to hold the exhibition on the religion of peace and used the money to extend the amount of knowledge available to visitors about the Altona area. That is to say, you know, keep living up to the name of the institution. Mind you, I'm not even saying that such an exhibition should never exist. Surely it could be in a more general history museum. After all, Muslim presence in present-day Germany dates back to at least the 1740s, and it's a topic worth studying, especially the organized Muslim organization's role during the National Socialist regime or the effect of the 1960s guest workers' program on the landscape. All of that has a place in a museum. But none of that is the case here. This is pure catechism in a country that goes far and wide, way into breaching basic human rights, if you ask me, all in order to maintain the appearance of religious neutrality. 
It's hard to blame many blogs and publications when they notice that none of that applies to the religion of special needs and exploit it for outrage clicks. Sure, that practice may sometimes lead to exaggerations, but none of that would have been possible if the double standards had not existed in the first place. So, to sum up, the religion of special needs is not one of the greatest civilizational achievements of northern Germany, despite what one might think if visiting this regional museum at the wrong period of the year. The decision makers need to get a grip on reality a little bit because otherwise things can precipitate. It's interesting uh, how many German intellectuals have taken up the task to produce even more literature about radicalization and, mind you, some of it pretty good, but very few are willing to consider that the artificial mainstream of which this museum is part of might in and of itself be contributing to that radicalization. Just a thought. Anyway, with all of that being said, I'd like to extend special thanks to Scheiss Squad both for providing the music and for the on-the-field support offered during the German tour. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Please consider a donation should you derive any value from the work being done here. Visit our website and I will see you all soon on The Freedom Alternative.